Hi. Good afternoon. <laughs> um, really happy to be here. Um, and the title of this talk is Almost Real. So this is the story. A few months ago, um, we've been working with a Google application, Google library, um, and we found some performance issue with it. Um, it was a drop-down menu, and if we um, added a lot of um, elements to the drop-down, when the drop-down was removed from the page, we had like three or four seconds of everything is stuck. Okay, so it looked like this. Okay, and if you don't know what this is, um, by the end of this talk, you will know exactly how to read it and how to use it. But um, I actually solved the issue and I sent my pull request to Google and I got this very happy message that um, my PR is ready for Google and my mother took it to the next level and put it on, on her living room. Um, and it was a very good experience, by the way. I learned a lot. Uh, the Google team just walked me through the whole pull request process and I found out two important things during the process. One is that Elon Musk gives the names to Google employees. And the other thing is that my improvement broke YouTube tests. And that means that YouTube is using my code right now. So if you go to YouTube and use the drop downs, that's me right there. So the agenda for today is solving performance issues. Okay, so you're gonna be experts on that in just 35 minutes. 30. <laughs> 30. Um, but really, we're going to learn some front end optimization techniques. Um, I'm using almost, okay, not daily, but a lot at, at my line of work. And I, um, they're going to help you, I'm pretty sure. So we'll start with some theory and we'll quickly go to um, how things work and how to fix things that are broken. Okay, YouTube is back, by the way. Okay, so how do we measure performance? Um, there are many ways to do it, but Google uh, kind of formalized it uh, with the rail model. I think they got it at 2015 or something, and it stands for response time. We want to respond to user interaction in less than 100 milliseconds, otherwise the user loses context of his action or her action, and um, we, we're going to lose the user. Um, animation, we want animation frames to work in 16 milliseconds or less, so we don't want heavy JavaScript running during animations, otherwise the user will get a bad experience. Idle time means to use the idle time of your app when nothing's happening to do the heavy calculations and make time for animation and response. And load time, I'm not going to talk much about it, but if you know Webpack, you know, or any other bundler, we have all this tree shaking, we want minification, uglification, um, whatnot to make our files uh, smaller and make the app load faster, um, and even less heavy JavaScript on load time to make it load faster. Um, we're going to start with something called the event loop. Who knows what the event loop is? Cool, a lot of people. So I'm going to surprise you. The event loop is a loop, um, and it looks kind of like this. Um, it's, a, it's an endless loop that's running all the time. Okay, it starts with the first script tag in your application and goes on from there. Okay, more tasks are added. You can see there's a task list. I hope you see the code. Okay, um, it has a task list and, and more tasks are added if you have a click event or a hover event or timer that runs out or a promise that is um, that resolves and uh, requests that coming from back from the server. Um, so it uh, you um, sorry it takes a task from the list. It starts it, then it fulfills all the micro tasks promises mostly, and it also needs to render. Okay, we need to actually see the change on screen. So this is why Google, um, I don't know, I think they 
set the term critical rendering path. That's the first time I've heard it. Um, and this is what's happening from the moment your JavaScript starts running, or the current synchronous process starts running. And you'll soon understand why it's important, that synchronous part. So JavaScript is running. When it finishes, the browser does style calculation, then layout, so where every div needs to be, the sizes and all that. Then paint and composite is actually painting, putting every color where it should be. And then you see the change on the screen. So this is what's happening from the moment you start running your JavaScript to the moment the user sees something on screen. Let's see how it looks in the wild. So we have this amazing application. Look what it does. Awesomeness and then a delay and awesomeness. It's a really awesome application. In order to see the critical rendering path, we go into the Performance tab in Google Chrome, and we start recording. And then we click Async, and we see the awesomeness, and we're very happy. Well, let's see what happens. So we have these two awesomeness from before, and then we see the third one right here after this little bump. OK, so something happened in this bump. So if I focus on this little bump, let's see. Where is everything? Sorry. OK. So if I focus on this little bump, I see a lot of JavaScript. This is the yellow part. And after JavaScript, I see styles, layout. All this part is layout, paint, and composite. OK, I can actually see the same critical rendering path happening in the browser. If I look at, uh, OK, this happens um, with some timer. This second awesomeness happens in a different uh, process, OK, uh, a different loop of the event loop because it's an async process. The, mo the moment it starts, it becomes, um, it becomes synchronous again. But I called it using set timeout in this case. And we can see it again. It's happening again the second time. So every time we have this JavaScript, styles layout, Paint composite. OK. So it might say, OK, you made a really nice example of showing us that. But in our real life applications, it's much more complex, right? So let's take a look at a more complex, a bit more complex example. One second. Don't worry. I'll, I'll get it moving. So. We'll run the demo here. I think it's this. Yes. And we'll go to the app. You can see the title is very descriptive. Um, we'll call some data from the server. Let's hope it works. Yes, I got some data from the server. And I opened the performance. Yeah. Yes. It's enough just to tickle it. So. Um, Yes, I know. Um, <laughs> OK, so let's see what happens when I do sort by name. I did not record. You're correct. So let's record. Sorry about that. Um, I don't want that. Probably don't want that. Uh, this one, yeah. Hopefully, it'll be okay. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so, it worked, but you didn't see what happened because we're focusing on my recording capabilities. So, uh, I click on sort by ID, and you see it takes some time for the sorting to actually happen. Da 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 da. And, and. Supposed to work. Oh, yeah, it worked. OK. I, I think that for any product manager, this is unacceptable, right? Um, let's do a quick sort by name. And it works much faster, right? You could see the difference. So um, what's the difference between these two functions? Can we find it using the performance tab, uh, the performance tool? So let's see. I start recording, and I sort by ID. Hopefully, it will work. It's taking ages. OK. 
Okay, it worked. Now I'll quick sort. And this also worked. And here we see the results. So first of all, we see that the sort by the, the sort without the quick, the slow sort, took much longer. You see this timeline? So the yellow is the JavaScript again. Um, the purple is the all the rendering, the layout and styles. So the layout and styles are kind of the same. The, the difference is JavaScript. So I know the problem of my app is bad JavaScript or slow JavaScript. And uh, using the performance tool, I can just click on the problematic JavaScript and just go to, let's say we go to the call tree. The call tree just takes this part of the function and tells me um, what function called other, another function, okay, from parent to child, and how long it took each function to run. So what I'm looking for is something with a big self time because this is probably the function that is making my code run slower. So I'm just looking, going down, scrolling down, scrolling down. Okay, and I see that there is a function here. Can you see the name? Yeah, and can you imagine why is it slower than quicksort? Yeah, can I want to? Okay, so using the performance tab, we, click, we quick, quickly found, and I can even click it and get to the problematic function, something, sometimes to the problematic uh, line in the code, um, we can easily found, find and quickly find uh, performance bottlenecks in our JavaScript. Okay, and this is like a real app. Okay, we have a grid, it gets data from the server, and we can debug performance. Um, so this was JavaScript, but in the browser, yes, that's good. We are all geeks here, so we all laugh from the same things. Um, we also have rendering. Okay, rendering, as we saw, we saw the style calculations and the layout calculations. Um, and actually, the layout process is the most more problematic of them. It's actually the thing that comes, I can, like a dictionary, it's the thing that comes after JavaScript and style and before paint and composite. But really, it's, it's the actual thing that um, sets, um, calculates where every element needs to be on screen. It happens to the entire page most of the time. And the more DOM elements we have, it's, the longer it takes. Okay. Um, what triggers this, um, the layout calculation, is mutations to the DOM which means when something moved or something changed its size. And what I mean by trigger, because the browser, because this is a heavy calculation, the browser, browser keeps cache of the last calculation. If nothing changed, if the, no mut mutation was made, so it just uses the cache. It doesn't recalculate the layout every time. Okay? So the browser is smart, but we can abuse it and we'll soon see how. Uh, one small point uh, that you might take home is the website CSS triggers because there are CSS properties that do not trigger um, mutations, do not trigger layout calculations like translate. Um, so you, um, if you do animation with translate, it's much better, or you move elements with translate, it's much more um, efficient. So what can go wrong? with layout calculations? How can we abuse this caching system that makes our browser run faster? There are two functions. They roughly do the same, although you might say they do not do the same. But roughly, they just change the class of an element and log the element's height. OK? Um, what happens in the left, on the left side, is that we change the size. And if you remember, changing the size is mutation. And then we want to log the height. So logging the height is measurement. So the moment the browser sees a measurement, it checks if the cache is still valid, if there was no mutation. And if it, the cache is invalid, it recalculates the style, the, sorry, the layout, during our JavaScript run. So our JavaScript function will take longer to run because it has to stop. The browser needs to calculate. It gets the results, and it all happens synchronously, so it takes time. In this case, 
it takes the height from the cache and then it changes the size so we're good so this is layout reflow Layout reflow is the most common problem with layout and rendering in the browser and this is really not good okay so remember always sorry the blue is measure always measure before you mutate okay and if you look closely at these functions you'll see that this log might or probably different uh, from the this log right so this solution might not work all the time to measure before muted and we'll see soon how to solve this one too so again you might say um, this is uh, not my app it's just a logging example why should I care so let's go back here it's uh, the app reflow one so just Just check this and run the demo again. Let's go back to our killer app, refresh the page, and get some data from the server, like you do in your day-to-day -day applications. I sort by name, and I quick sort, and it's working, nice. But if I go to the performance tab, let's start recording. I sort again, doesn't really matter what I'm sorting. Um, it's taking some time. This is also okay. So I see these these uh, three sorting. Yay! <clears throat> these three sorting um, parts in my app. Let's go here. And if I look at the, let's see. I think I got it wrong. Where is it? Sorry, I think I got it wrong. Da, 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 da. Oh, I think I need to refresh the page. Sorry, my bad. Let's see, one last time. Yep. Okay, sorry, didn't refresh the page. So, um, you see that our, what's going on? Um, you see that now during JavaScript run, I have this recalculate style and layout, layout, and this is the reflow in real life. Okay, so you'd really like to avoid it because it adds more time to my JavaScript, and I don't want that because it happens again here. We don't want it to happen twice. So you saw one way to solve it. We need to measure before we mutate. But um, if we look at the code here, this is the problem with our code we add more elements to the dome which is mutation and then we emit an event that uh, emits the scroll height and this is measurement so if we do something like that I just cha change it to a constant and run the demo again and also remember to refresh the page and let's do this this worked Okay, and we're back to the code without the layout calculation. So you now see that the problem was that we measured after we mutated the dome. Okay, it repeats itself, same principle. Okay, um, so we have this layout reflow and we have another term called layout thrashing. It's, um, it's not so gentle but um, it's it happens when you do layout reflow a lot of times it kind of you can see there is a loop here and we measure sorry we mutate and we measure and we mutate and we measure over over and over again it looks kind of like this you see javascript that is covered by rendering um, you have a lot of warnings like this in the browser in the chrome dev tools and this is how it looks in the flame chart okay you see a lot a lot lots of purple during your JavaScript run and this is pretty bad because your JavaScript takes a lot of time to run this way so the solution again is to prevent measurement after mutation okay the synchronous solution would be to cache the parent width and use the same width over and over again okay and this way 
it will look like this again. So we solve the problem. Okay, measure before mutate. We go back to the original problem. Yeah. Um, we change the, the element's size, and then we wanted to console log the correct height, the new height. Okay, so we know this will cause the problem. So how do we use our knowledge with the event loop and critical rendering path to solve this problem? All we need to do is use an asynchronous flow because we know that um, the layout calculation happens once in the crit crit during one crit critical rendering path, sorry. Um, and if we postpone our measurement to the next um, event loop cycle, then we, uh, we actually avoid another calculation and we use the cache calculated in the end of the former um, critical rendering path. It will look something like this. We have our what's running right now, and then it calculates the layout as usual, and then we make a request in the next time we have JavaScript running. So it will use the cache from here. Okay? If it's not clear, feel free to raise your hand and I'll explain again. I really like this one, this um, drawing. Okay, um, I'll send you the. Cool. Two? Two? No, you said five. Five. Cool. Okay, ten. Um, so. <laughs> Um, I have a few examples here because I have five. You missed the examples, but I'll send you the presentation. You'll be able to test them yourself. This, uh, all the solutions are here, and you'll be able to use the performance tool to measure them. Let's look at some examples from production. So this is Cesium GS. It's kind of a uh, uh, Google Earth clone or native um, JavaScript implementation of Google Earth. And we had a task to put a lot of entities on the map. And it looked kind of, it kind of stuck our UI, the whole UI. And researching using the performance tool, um, I found out that two functions were to blame. Okay, and I found out that these functions ran every, every um, frame or like every uh, rendering cycle of the map. And it happened because uh, we had like 50,000 entities but only 600 of them changed. And this is quite wasteful. So what I did was I used the um, dirty flag pattern. And what, I, and what happens with that is that you uh, notify Cesium who you need to update. Okay, you get data from the server. Let's say 600 cats on the map needs to update their location. So you just add a flag for those who changed. So when Cesium goes over all the entities, it updates 600 and ignores the rest of the 50 50, yeah, 50,000. And these are the differences, okay? If you look at the summary, this is before half the time scripting without anyone touching the app. Yeah. And this is after. So we get a lot of idle time. Remember idle time from the rail model? So we get a lot of idle time to do many other things. And the app was saved, and I still had my job. So um, true story. This is the blog post uh, featured on the Cesium blog of uh, the whole thing if you like to read it and see how to tackle performance issues in production. Another thing, this guy is called Kfir, and he implemented uh, um, infinite scroll in, um, in a menu with lots of items. And this is infinite scroll. You can see that it adds more items as we go. And we, knew, we know now that um, layout calculations are a function of DOM elements. So uh, if you decrease the amount of DOM elements, then the calculation is cheaper. So you can see it here. You have a lot of calculations, and after implementing infinite scroll, then we get it much more cheaper. We get more, a performance boost. Um, but we know that virtual scroll is not, uh, infinite scroll is not so good. So we have virtual scroll. We don't have time for the example, so we'll skip it, but you'll be able to see it later. And this is a story from my first week at WalkMe. We have this menu, and there was a problem with its performance. So I just used this tool again, found out a function, improved it by 
I don't know, 60 milliseconds, 70 milliseconds. And then it proved it again by another 50 milliseconds. And again, I didn't have to do anything for three years because of this glory. Um, so, <laughs> optimize your CPU usage, your scripting, and also your rendering using the performance tab. And what about Node.js? It's the same, and click this link when I send you, and you'll know how to do it in Node.js too. Thank you. That was me. <laughs> Amazing. You know.